Hey y'all, welcome and welcome back. So it is finally time. I have been teasing this video for quite a while now. It's just taken a really long time to get through and work on it, but it's ready now. So today I want to talk to you guys about the effect of capitalism and corporate greed on modern day doll production. <laughs> I'm sure you guys have already seen the timestamp. Obviously right now, I don't know how long it's going to be, but I know it's going to be long. Um, so I guess buckle in. That's the best way that I can advise you. We have a lot to get through, so I'm going to be as quick as possible, but I also don't want to rush anything because like this is a deep dive you know so grab some popcorn if you need to grab like a whole meal if you need to and uh, prepare yourselves before I can get started though I always have a few disclaimers there's a couple extra ones this video so the first one that you guys are used to is that this is just my opinion as per usual if you disagree with me or agree with me I would love to hear your thoughts and feelings in the comments below but with this one especially it is kind of delving into the realm of economics and capitalism and all of that. So I do need to say that I don't have higher education or a college degree or any experience really in economics. So this is my opinion. It's like based off of observations that I can make, but I do need to say that I'm not an expert whatsoever. And so I know that it is absolutely more than possible for me to be wrong. So kind of going in, I want you guys to know that I'm not claiming to be like the foremost expert on this. Uh, I just have thoughts and feelings. Second part of the disclaimers is that any prices I have are going to be in US dollars. That's always the case for my videos, but because I'm going to be mentioning more prices than usual in this video, I did just want to say upfront that all prices are going to be in US dollars. I also do have a bunch of sources and stuff listed in the description below if you want to check any of those out. And then the last thing to get out of the way is that I usually do the whole like like, comment, subscribe thing at the end of my videos, but I just don't feel like that's quite appropriate for this one. We're tackling like a bit of a more serious topic than I usually do, and so I feel like it would be weird to be talking about something that like is gonna get maybe a little bit dark and then at the end be like, but follow me. So um, instead I wanna say, if you reach the end of this video and you find that you did enjoy it, if you could like it, that would be awesome. If you want to see more like this or just more whimsical doll content also, you could subscribe. I also have an Instagram and a coffee always linked in the description if you want to check those out. And then lastly, I know this is a long one, sorry, but if you want to support something other than myself, but that I care deeply about. I always have in my description linked um, the website and some wish lists for Tabby Tales Cat Rescue. I'm not affiliated with them whatsoever. They don't know that I'm doing this and I'm not getting paid to do it or anything like that. I just think that they're a cat rescue doing really good stuff. So if you have a few extra bucks and you can donate to them, that would be radical. So <laughs> that's that out of the way. Now we can finally actually dive into the topic of this video. I did debate a lot on how to format this video to make it the most coherent it could possibly be because I have so many thoughts that sometimes it's kind of hard for me to like funnel them all into something that makes sense. I have like a document of notes off screen here to make sure that I don't forget anything and that I kind of sort of stay on track and I probably rewrote that script like three to four times in the course of making this video, but I think that we are good now. I think that the best way to go about doing this is to present to you the kind of basis of what I think is happening within the doll making community and then kind of dive deeper into a brand by brand basis on how I think that brand specifically is experiencing this. So like if you are an American, this probably sounds a little bit high school essay to you where I'm gonna like make a thesis and then make my points what can I say? I was also educated in America. So like I'm going back to my high school essay roots. To start off, I want to say that I do very, very firmly believe there is an art to doll making. Obviously, if you do like a quick Google search, you can find all kinds of independent doll artists who create absolutely amazing things. Sometimes that's making a custom doll out of a base doll, or sometimes that's literally hand making an entire doll, which I think is just insane. I can't believe people are that talented. So there's obviously an artistry to that, but I would say that there's also an artistic point to mass-produced dolls. I mean, technically speaking, I think anytime there is something that has an aesthetic value, there's an artistry to it. Part of the appeal of dolls is that they look nice. So like, I do want to say that I think that people don't always consider mass-produced dolls art because they are mass-produced and typically intended to be played with, but I do think that they are still an art form. That's just kind of a general thing that I wanted to say because if you don't think that mass-produced dolls have artistic value, the rest of this video might as well just get thrown out the window because <laughs> like you're not going to follow along. So that's like baseline number one. But my big theory here is that when it comes to companies like MGA and Mattel who are mass producing dolls, there are four key elements that need to be in place in order for their doll sales to be as successful as possible. 
In order to define that success, I am going to be doing so as a company would, regardless of what other things might be in play that like determine what a company is going to make. Profit is always the number one thing. If they're selling something, that's why they are selling something is to make money. So I am going to be defining success as in they have a product that is profitable to them and then also as one that consumers enjoy because those two do go hand in hand. If consumers don't like your product, you're not going to make a profit. So you have to have happy customers and profit in order to be successful. So that brings us to the four key elements. The first is the artistic element. A doll does need to have some visual appeal, whether that's stereotypical or more out of the box, like companies like Monster High. The look has to appeal to some sort of consumer base. Two is the quality. Usually when I talk quality on this channel, it's in terms of is something well made or is there a misprint to it? And that is also a factor here, but also when it comes to like the umbrella of the quality thing, I want to include it being safe to play with. If a doll has too many small parts for the target age that they are trying to like sell to, it's not going to be safe or appropriate to play with. And also it needs to have stuff that's quality enough to be able to withstand being played with. So that's kind of all under the umbrella of quality. The third element is production cost. Dolls obviously don't just like appear out of thin air. They do have to be made by somebody and it does cost money for them to be made. And obviously for a company to make profit, the production cost has to be lower than the selling price, which is the fourth element, selling price. A consumer isn't going to be as interested in a doll if it is extremely unaffordable, especially on like a playline level. So the retail cost is also a big factor here. So my theory is that all four of these elements have to be in balance, very much Avatar The Last Airbender style. If one of them goes like kind of out of whack, it's going to cause ripple effects into the others and into the overall success of a doll company. So if a doll is well made and it's cost effective to make, but it's not visually appealing, fewer people are going to buy it. If a doll is beautiful and made really well, those effects can be completely nullified if it's not cost effective to make because a company simply won't make it. If a doll is beautiful and cost effective to produce, but it is very low quality, People will buy it at first because it's pretty, but then they're going to stop buying it when they realize that it's not very quality and the sales won't last for very long. And then lastly, if a mass produced doll is too expensive, not as many people are going to buy it, which is going to cut into a company's profits. So in a very general sense, my theory is that all four of these things need to not only be present, but also well balanced in order for a company to have the most possible success when it comes to profit and consumer happiness. So with that in place as kind of the basis for this video, I think it's now time to go ahead and delve into brand specific examples and how I think they kind of fit into this narrative. I'm going to try my best, like I said before, to keep this cohesive. I'm really sorry if I seem like I'm bouncing kind of all over the place, but I promise we're going to get through these brands and then we're going to kind of funnel it into something that makes sense by the end of this video. <laughs> Let's go ahead and start with a brand that is arguably most known for its decline in popularity and quality over the years, which is obviously going to be Barbie. <laughs> you all know the name and that in and of itself says a lot. Barbie is a household brand even to people who don't collect dolls and has been around longer than most other doll companies manage to last. A doll that has been around as long as Barbie has is bound to have experienced ups and downs when it comes to how much money they make and how popular they are. but. It's pretty universally accepted that the downturn that Barbie is currently in is like the worst one. And it's been, again, pretty widely accepted that Barbie has been in this real decline for a long while. I am definitely not the first person to ask what happened to Barbie. If you look up why Barbie has been in decline, I at least wasn't able to find many concrete answers, but you will find forum after forum and page after page of other people asking the same question that I'm asking now. Like I said, it's pretty universally accepted that Barbie is not in her heyday right now and everyone wants to know what's going on. Barbie has kind of gone from being the doll to have to being viewed as a disappointing or kind of a more budget line. I knew this from my own limited experience. I, like many people, had Barbies as a young kid and then I didn't really collect them. They were never like a collector doll for me. I just had them as a kid until recently. And then as an adult collector going into it, it's like, these don't look the same as when I was younger. Not just the designs have changed, but kind of the overall feel of Barbies has changed. So I knew that it was kind of a problem, but I didn't realize how big a problem it was until I got a little bit more into Barbie and started looking really closely at dolls that I might purchase for my collection and seeing just how bad the drop off has been. I know this section is probably going to be redundant for a lot of you, but I do want to go over a couple of examples to really show 
just how different Barbie dolls are kind of now versus then. Just so that you guys know that it's not a nostalgia stain, it really is a genuine problem. If you are familiar with this, it'll just be a little refresher, and if you're not, I guess prepare yourselves, because like, you hear the Barbie is in decline, but you don't really realize how bad it is until you see it. For this first example, I wanted to look at a couple of Mermaid Barbies. So I have a Mermaid Fantasy Barbie from 2002 and then a Dreamtopia Mermaid Barbie that is currently available online and in retailers. Both of these dolls have unique tails, which is pretty cool. The old one has a silicone tail that is movable and also like a silicone tail, which I have never seen on another doll. And then the current one does have a tail that lights up. I wanted to choose this one because it's one of the more exciting Mermaid Barbies that are currently on the market, so I figured it was only fair to give them like the best chance possible. There are a couple key differences between these two Barbies, one being that the modern day mermaid is all plastic except for her hair. She has a molded tail and a molded top and then obviously her plastic crown whereas the older Barbie has the silicone tail and then fabric top and arm warmers. That's like the best thing I can call them. The other big difference is the color scheme. So the older one has a couple of colors that are fairly bright but it's not like too much in my opinion and there were a few different variations of colors for different dolls in this line but they all had just one or two colors in their color scheme whereas the current Dreamtopia mermaid her color scheme is every single color <laughs> and that's a really common theme amongst fantasy themed Barbies right now like if you go down the Barbie aisle in a toy store you're gonna see a lot of rainbows which is just exactly that it's a lot to me <laughs> You can kind of see what I'm talking about with this next example, which is two fairy themed dolls. So the first one is an Elena doll from 2007. Not quite as old, but still a pretty good example of a slightly older uh, fairy Barbie. And then the current fairy Barbie is also from the Dreamtopia line. Objectively speaking, I don't think that anybody is going to argue with me when I say that the Fairy Topia Elena doll is much more impressive, especially when it comes to her wings. To me, wings are kind of what makes a fairy doll obviously a fairy doll, so they're a very important part. And the ones on the current Barbie are just gross. Like, I don't have a nicer way to say that. They just look bad. You can see again here, too, with the color schemes being different. It's interesting because the Fairy Topia Barbie is bright pink. Like, her colors are not muted at all. But to me, the way that that's styled and designed seems to be more of a classic Barbie pink color scheme. Whereas the current one just seems kind of like rainbow vomit, and it's just so bad. I think that you can have bright colors in a way that is very purposeful and exciting, but this just seems like the design team got as far as kids like bright colors and then stopped caring after they heard that. Now these are only a couple examples. I don't want to bore you guys by going like over and over and over every single Barbie doll and how pretty much all of them are worse now, but I think that you get the gist. That is when it comes to Playline Barbie. When it comes to collector Barbie dolls, it's definitely a little bit more complicated to talk about, but I'm still going to tackle it. The main complication is that there are so many different kinds of Collector Barbie. It's not like they're all at the same level and they're all $100. There's a lot of variations, so that definitely muddies the waters as far as direct comparisons go. And as far as I can tell, that's always been the case with Barbie, where she has a lot of different kind of levels of collector dolls. To be fully transparent, I had a really hard time doing the research for this video, finding like retail prices for older collector Barbies. So for example, I can go on eBay and I can see what a doll from 2000 would cost me to buy now, but I really had such a hard time finding what that doll cost when she first came out. So it's very, very difficult to do one-to-one -one comparisons of old and new collector Barbies because of that fact. It also means that I'm only assuming that older collector Barbies had the same variation in prices. I do think that's a fair assumption, but just in the effort to be like fully transparent and fully fair to Barbie in this video, that is an assumption that I'm making. Where things seem to differ in terms of then versus now on collector Barbies is the bang for your buck factor. <laughs> From what I can tell, being part of the doll community, a lot of people are displeased with just how much Barbie charges for their collector dolls. A lot of their collector dolls for other brands would just be regular Playline dolls. That's like comparative quality wise. Of course, there are some people who are totally fine with it, and price versus quality is a very subjective area, so I can't say anything concrete here, but I would say that the more popular prevailing opinion is that Barbie is charging a lot for her collector dolls, and they aren't really living up to that price point. The other thing I want to talk about when it comes to Barbie collector dolls is that to purchase some of them, you have to be part of a membership. 
So I don't know if other countries have something like this, but in the United States, at least in my area of the United States, we have a couple of bulk buy stores. There's Sam's Club and then there's Costco. And those stores are places where you have a membership fee. Usually it's a yearly fee and you have to have that membership to be allowed to go in and shop there. But the way that this is kind of made up for is that these are bulk stores. So you're buying like a pack of four things of toothpaste instead of one individual tube and you get discounts on those and they have sales and everything. So you go there and you're bulk buying and you end up paying lower prices than you would grocery shopping at other stores. So obviously, depending on what you buy, sometimes the cost of membership is completely recouped or more than made up for by the sales that they have and like the price that you're paying for the items. So in a sense, they are kind of discount stores because yes, you have to pay the membership, but you are getting better prices inside. So in that sense for, you know, some people it is worth it. That's not the case with Barbie though, with her Barbie signature membership. If you pay the membership fee, you are then allowed to buy the dolls, but there are no discounts. There's not like sales that you get because of that. It's just, you have to pay the membership fee to then also pay for the doll. <laughs> now there are some perks with this membership. If you look at Mattel Creations where you can buy the Barbie Signature membership, they have kind of a list of perks. Those perks include obviously the exclusive items, being exclusive dolls in this case. <laughs> they also mention exclusive member forums, voting rights to help decide what dolls might be produced, exclusive news and updates, but that's it. To me, it reads very much like a Patreon membership would. So with Patreon though, you're supporting an individual artist. We'll say artist in this case. So like compare it to a person who's making OOK dolls on Patreon, right? If you support them on Patreon, you are paying for updates and behind the scenes and sneak peeks because they're an individual artist and they need that extra support because they don't have this huge following behind them, right? And they're just one person kind of like a small business that you want to show extra support to. It makes sense for someone like that to have a Patreon. I mean, I have a coffee that I plugged at the beginning of his channel, which is like the same thing, but it doesn't make sense for me to have that with Barbie, like using another brand, for example, for a second, just because I buy more from Rainbow High. If Rainbow High were to post on their social medias that they had started a Patreon where you could pay them for behind the scenes looks, I, would laugh. Like there's no reason that a huge company like Rainbow High needs me to support them on Patreon because they don't need the extra support. They're selling tons and tons of dolls. Their dolls are in major retailers across the world. Like you don't need a Patreon. So to me, it's kind of weird because the Barbie signature membership feels like a Patreon, but Mattel doesn't need that either. <laughs> I asked here on YouTube and then also on Instagram and a few different Reddit threads when Barbie started doing this, when they started having these memberships. And I got a few answers that weren't super clear. So like another disclaimer here, I am not 100% on any of this. Most people said that this practice started in the 90s and the most common answer I got was the example of the 1997 Holiday Barbie, where if you were a member, you could get an exclusive hair color and she was still available for everyone else. That was just like the normal hair color, normal. And if you were a member, you could get kind of the exclusive hair color. So it was a situation where it was the same doll. You just kind of had a variation that you were able to get if you were a serious collector and you were part of the membership. In addition to that, one particularly helpful commenter on Reddit told me that before the Barbie signature membership, there was the Barbie fan club. With that, it was kind of the same thing where they would have some exclusive dolls or exclusive variations of dolls, but they would also have other perks, which included quarterly discounts, something that is notably not present with the Barbie signature membership. This information is all secondhand. So like I said, take it with a grain of salt, but if these people are correct, that means that yes, Barbie has had some sort of membership program for a while, which in general, I do feel is a weird thing to have, but at least in the beginning, it seems like the exclusive dolls were sometimes just variations instead of fully exclusive dolls, or you might get discounts along with exclusive dolls. So it seems to me like in the past, if this is all true, it was much more worth it. Whereas now you are literally just paying for the privilege of buying a Barbie. On a very, very small level, it kind of reminds me of the Hermes situation. If you guys aren't familiar, Hermes is a designer brand that is most known for their bags. But here's the thing. You cannot just walk into an Hermes store 
no matter how much money you have and decide that you want to buy a bag. That's not allowed. Instead, you kind of have to build up being a client of theirs and buy a lot of other products and also have a certain appearance. I can't really get into this, but like they won't just sell an Hermes bag to anybody, right? You have to fit the part. And then you're offered a bag if they decide that you are worthy. They will say, okay, you've spent X amount of money with us. You're a good client. You've got nice social media or whatever and we'll let you have this bag. They pick it, like you don't get to pick the bag, they offer it to you. That's like very short. A lot of people have done really in-depth videos on Hermes, so you should definitely check those out because they're fascinating and awful. But on a very small level, the Barbie Signature membership kind of reminds me of that, where it's not like you get discounts or anything to me that would make it worthwhile. It's just, oh, you want this Barbie? pay us $10 and then you can also pay for her. It's a very weird situation to me and I don't know if this is a hot take, but I do think that it says a lot that Barbie has this. Like it just says a lot to me about their priorities and where they kind of are financially. So to sum that all up, sorry, I know that was a lot. In general, it's agreed upon by many, many doll collectors that Barbie's quality in Playline dolls has decreased dramatically. And when it comes to collector dolls, the quality versus price is just not quite aligned properly. But what does that all mean? Like, I know that was a lot of information, but it still brings us back to the question of why. Here's my theory. I think that when Barbie started out, there wasn't as much competition in the doll market as there is now. Obviously there was some, like I'm not discounting other brands that have come and gone, but I think that there was a lot less competition. Barbie was able to become a household brand that could stand the test of time, not only because she used to consistently produce show-stopping dolls, but also because there weren't as many dolls bringing the same level of competition to the table. In the modern era though, there's tons of competition from Bratz to Monster High to LOL to Rainbow High. Barbie doesn't quite dominate shelves the same way she used to. I say quite because she definitely still dominates. I know at least in my area, any store that you walk into that sells toys, there's gonna be one aisle for Barbie and then one aisle for pretty much every other doll. Sometimes two for every other doll, but Barbie gets a dedicated space. So she is still very, very popular, but there is definitely a lot more competition than she has faced in the past. So to me, in response to a world where other people are making dolls that are on the same level as your brand that are forcing you to face real competition, I think that Barbie had a couple of options. One, they could go back to the artistry of doll making and try to grow even more and maintain their status as the doll because they just keep hitting it out of the park. That option would cost more and it definitely does pose more risk because if a design isn't popular, they've kind of failed. But if a design is popular, it has a lot of reward to it. So that's a very high risk, high reward option. The other option is that they could be the doll simply because that's the status quo. They've always been the doll, so why stop now? They can lower the quality because they know that people are still going to buy Barbie because it's Barbie, and that way they lower their production costs and it doesn't matter if the sales aren't quite as high as they used to be. I think that definitely option one is high risk, high reward. Option two is a safer option. Putting in the terms of the key factors that I was talking about earlier, option one sees Barbie upping the artistic factor, upping the quality, and then probably having to up the production cost a little bit to account for that. But if it goes well, I think that their sales would make it worth it. Option two has them lowering the artistic value, lowering the quality, and lowering production costs, which means that kind of by default, as long as someone is going to buy Barbie, they can maintain or even maybe increase profit a little bit. I think that option one is kind of the better thing to do, in my opinion. I think that upping your artistry and seeing competition and kind of bringing your A game is a better way to go. But I don't think that's what Barbie did. I think that Barbie went ahead and went with option two and just decided that they would rather protect their pockets rather than the artistic value of their products. I do want to say I'm not trying to make the argument that Barbie has nothing worthwhile to put out now. She still does make some dolls that are nice, it's just not nearly as consistent as it used to be. And at the end of the day, I think that using the benefit of having such a well-known name and the money that comes with that to keep pushing forward and keep making beautiful and wonderful things would have been so amazing. But instead, Mattel chose to make Barbie a quiet moneymaker. She's not the most exciting doll on the market anymore, but she is one that rakes in the dough because of her name. She makes enough cool dolls to maintain some collector interest and maintain that facet of her sales, but it's not all the time. She's not constantly making new, innovative, and exciting dolls. Mostly, she's just putting out dolls that are cheaply made 
and just interesting enough to keep someone buying them to maintain the highest possible profit margins with little to no care for the heart that was once so evident in every single one of her products. That's a bit of a downer, sorry, um, but unfortunately we still have a lot more to talk about. That definitely sums up everything I think I have to say on Barbie, but we still have a few other brands to get through, so let's go ahead, just keep on pushing forward, and let's talk about Mermaid High. Mermaid High was canceled after a very, very short run. I did one review on a doll, and she was fine, she was cute enough, but these dolls did retail at around $26 or $27, and the quality just absolutely did not line up. I think the way I worded it in that review was that it's basically dollar store quality, except they were almost $30 dolls, so that definitely turned me off from them. Now that the line has been canceled though, we have been seeing some original design concepts and also prototypes of the dolls popping up. Perhaps even more importantly, these designs were posted on Instagram by someone who was on the design team for Mermaid High, and they did come with a little bit of behind the scenes information on what was going on in the production process. The prototypes of the Mermaid High dolls revealed that not only were some design choices heavily changed before these dolls made it to market, but also that a lot of details seem to have been lost and a lot of whimsy seem to have been lost. I will have the Instagram post linked below so you guys can read it in full. I also do want to say that Darling Dolls here on YouTube did a full video dedicated solely to Mermaid High ending and that's probably a lot more detail than I'm going to go into here so you should definitely check that out. But the gist of what happened based upon the designer on Instagram is that executives were so unhappy with the originality of Mermaid High and the original designs for Mermaid High that they continuously asked designers to go back to the drawing board and remake their designs. This resulted in the actual production of the dolls being delayed and by the time they were finally shipped out they were kind of out of favor with retailers. This meant that Mermaid High was not displayed super super well in stores they weren't getting optimal shelf space or being advertised the most which is not good for any doll brand but especially a new one they just weren't getting the attention that a new brand kind of needs so basically it seems as though the designers weren't allowed to do what they wanted to do and because of the ripple effect that that caused and the chain of events that that caused mermaid high started out already really really bad they all kind of started off already at a loss i've worked in both food service and retail and this seems kind of like a version of a story that happens a lot there where you'll have the people who work there every single day mostly for minimum wage and they know what's happening in their facility right but you have the owner who isn't there every single day who will come in and make changes that an everyday worker could tell you are terrible ideas but no one is asking the everyday workers no one is asking the minimum wage workers even though they do most of the work and it's just up to the owner and the owner will make these decisions and then wonder why it doesn't go well and blame the workers who really weren't at fault at all and could have helped if they had been asked. It seems a little bit like that's what's happening with Mermaid High or rather what happened with Mermaid High. The designers had good unique ideas and were kind of thwarted at every single attempt to make those ideas a reality. In the end we were left with a doll brand that was really poor quality and had fine designs but definitely not as good as they could have been. To be fair there's no way of knowing for 100% sure if the quality would have been better if this fight between the designers and the executives hadn't happened but I do think it's safe to say that the designs would have been better and perhaps if they had had more time to make these dolls the quality would have been better as well. So with Mermaid High in the end the artistic factor, the quality, and the consumer cost were all way off balance. <laughs> I have no idea what production costs look like, but with three out of the four aspects that I'm talking about in this video out of whack, it's not really shocking to me that Mermaid High didn't last long. You will see as we go along in this video that most doll brands that I'm talking about are still around. Like, they have their faults and their problems, and obviously my complaints are I wouldn't be making this video. But Mermaid High is really interesting because they've not only lost consumer faith and they haven't only lost, like, favor with their customers, but the brand got shut down, like the brand has been discontinued. And that's the only time on this list that we really see a full implosion of a brand. So Mermaid High's story is shorter and arguably a little bit sadder than Barbie's considering the brand is not available really anymore. Um, but we're still not done, it's time to talk about Rainbow High. Rainbow High came out in 2020 and they started off being really exceptional dolls. For the retail price of $25, you got a doll that was fully articulated, had inset eyes, and came with both a stand and two outfits. Like, that was an insanely good deal. I know that not everyone likes Rainbow High and that is completely fair. Not everyone can like everything. And in the current day, there's a lot more reason to not like Rainbow High, but I don't think that I can stress enough how good a deal this was. Like, these dolls genuinely 
were such a good price for everything that they came with, especially since before they came out, there was a bit of a lull in the doll market. Yeah, you had LOL, OMG, and then there was also Hair Amazing that had some popularity, but there was definitely a dead zone before Rainbow High came out. Like, I wasn't even collecting. There were not as many exciting dolls on the market. Since they came out, other more exciting doll brands have happened, but Rainbow High really kind of filled a gap in the market and for such a good price and such good quality this was a big deal when they first came out rainbow high is also noticeable because they started off as a brand that seemed like they were going to really listen to their fans and their consumer base series one had a lot of problems not the least of which was the lack of diversity in skin tone tons and tons and tons of people myself included commented on this and complained about it and mga made a really quick switch with series two that led to some other problems, but led also to Crystal having much darker skin tone than she originally was going to. So yeah, there were other problems involved with Series 2, but it was impressive that Rainbow High and MGA heard the complaints about skin diversity and did something about it so quickly. It kind of set the standard for the brand that maybe they were really going to listen to consumer feedback. It made a lot of people, myself included again, very hopeful that other problems would be resolved because it seemed like they were going to be listening to feedback and doing something about it. But unfortunately, that has not continued to be the case. Furthermore, they've also gone from being a doll brand that is really affordable considering what all you get to one whose prices are odd at best. So following production, of series one the initial release of rainbow high there were a few others in here that i'm not going to cover but i just want to talk about the ones where the pricing got a little funky first of all was kaya hart she was marketed as a special edition doll even though she wasn't limited edition and wasn't like a retail exclusive it was a very interesting situation she came with a few extra pieces and a slightly different box than normal rainbow high dolls and originally retailed at 40 dollars. so when she first came out considering she looked almost exactly like a regular doll. The price was a little bit high. People were not the happiest, but also not the most upset. It could have been a lot worse. So that one was kind of a mediocre one. Then there was the original collector doll for Rainbow High, Jet Dawson. She came with a bunch of extra stuff and she had extra articulation, but I've said this a thousand times before, the quality control was really, really bad. They also had numbered and non-numbered versions of her, where on Amazon, if you bought her you could get a numbered version every other like in-person retail you would get a non-numbered version but the thing with that was that there was no way of guaranteeing that you got a numbered versus a non-numbered version off of amazon it was just complete luck of the draw which i think is a terrible way to go about that so that was all very very odd and then also her price tag of 60 dollars it was a little high at the time like people were not happy especially considering the quality but like it only keeps getting worse from there. <laughs> Those two technically were specialty dolls, but Rainbow High has continued to get more just completely out of pocket with their pricing for even regular dolls. Their Pacific Coastline introduced dolls that had an extra set of legs, but only had one real outfit and then came with like a bag and a towel. And those were $32. Another collector doll, Lily Chang came out and while she was way, way better quality wise than Jet. She also was $80, which is a significant price hike. The Junior Highline came out at $25, which is the same as the original set of Rainbow High dolls, but they didn't have a stand or a second outfit. And they also had tons of quality control problems. <laughs> it seems like the more Rainbow High has pushed out, the more erratic they have gotten with their prices and what all is included for that price tag. And this year for me, has been a particular doozy. I have ranted about this ad nauseum, but I do have to mention it shortly for this video. They came out with a line of blind box shoes and um, purses that retail at $10 for one item, and they are blind boxes, so you have no idea what you're going to get. You're never gonna convince me that's worth it, but we're gonna move on. <laughs> they came out with a Dia de los Muertos doll that had a lot of controversy surrounding her, and even though she was a collector doll, she retailed at $130, which is way higher than either Jet Dawson or Lily Chang before her. They also came out with the Costume Ball line, which was a Walmart exclusive, where you had to pay $38 for one doll with one outfit. I know that is a lot of prices and releases, so I'm sorry, but Rainbow High has pushed out a lot that has been quite weird, and we're still not done, because next up was Roxy Grand, who is the holiday doll for this year. She might look very similar to another doll that you're familiar with, the Rainbow Divas, also by Rainbow High. 
The only difference between the Rainbow Divas and Roxy Grand is that Roxy Grand has a special box and she also comes with a lot less, but she retails for more. Depending on where you got her from, she either retails at $60 or $80, but even taking the best case scenario there at $60, the Rainbow Divas were $40. So you're paying $20 extra for a doll that looks very similar with less that she comes with. It didn't make sense at all. Some of the releases that Rainbow Ha had that had contentious pricing, I kind of glossed over, but this one I really wanted to dwell on because I think it's so fascinating that they came out with two dolls that were so similar with such vast differences in terms of what they come with. And then they seem to have like flip flopped which one was worth more money, where they put the one that comes with less at a much higher price point. And it's just, is such a bizarre decision to make. And that's still not everything because we have just recently seen photos of the Rainbow High collector's doll for Paris Hilton. This doll was first announced when Pacific Coast came out because in the episodes that went along with that doll launch, she was like a guest star. I think she was the principal of the Pacific Coast High School. I don't watch the episode, so I don't know for sure, but she did guest star in the webisodes. And so now she's finally getting the doll that was announced way back then. And I have a lot to say about this. <laughs> Firstly, I do want to say that I'm not trying to direct any hate or criticism to Paris Hilton herself. I have nothing against her, like I don't know much about her, and this has nothing to do with her as a person. But from the beginning I thought that it was kind of weird that Rainbow High decided to collaborate with her and have her kind of be a celebrity cameo in Rainbow High. Again, this is not because I have any particular ill will towards Paris Hilton, but frankly, I just had no idea she was still relevant. Now the issue of like relevancy and celebrity and social media and all of that is fast and complicated and not what we're talking about here. So I'm not trying to say that Paris is actually worth more or less as a human being because she's more or less relevant. She's not, like relevancy has nothing to do with your worth as a human, but I just wanted to kind of disclaim that really quick. That's not what we're focusing on though. <laughs> just in terms of the fact that relevancy is a thing in today's social media fueled world, there are people who are more or less relevant and therefore more or less popular. And therefore, if you're going to have a celebrity cameo, if you have one who is more relevant or more popular, they're probably going to bring in more sales, right? So I was just kind of surprised that Paris was the celebrity of choice for Rainbow High. Granted, I have absolutely no idea how much it costs to have someone like her do some voice lines for your show or to be able to produce a doll of her. I don't know like what the rates are for different celebrities. So it's very, very possible that cost was the limiting factor in who Rainbow High decided to feature. I'm also very openly terrible at keeping up with pop culture. It's honestly so stressful to me. The sheer amount of actors and actresses and singers and people in TV shows and then the shows themselves and the movies themselves, it is so much to keep up with. I have no idea how people do it because I simply can't. So it's possible that Paris Hilton is way more popular than I know. Like I could be in the wrong here. I could be just insanely out of the loop and she could be extremely relevant. But to me, I didn't realize that she had been at any sort of like height of popularity since like the early 2000s. I just wasn't under the impression that she's someone who's topping popularity polls, especially when it comes to the younger demographic who's actually the target audience for Rainbow High. Honestly, if they had like a tight budget for who they could get, I think it would have made more sense for them to get a TikTok influencer to guest star with Rainbow High, just because I feel like, again, with my limited knowledge, maybe that would have been more relevant to kids who again are the target demographic and the people who are watching the show. That is also kind of a weird point because kids are the ones who are mainly watching the show, but the Paris Hilton doll is a collector doll. So the doll technically isn't aimed at kids, but the show where she cameoed is, I don't know, that's kind of all very confusing for me. But aside from the relevancy issue, the doll itself also confuses me. So she looks just like a regular Rainbow High doll. She has two outfits. She does come with a couple of extra things, being a phone with a phone case and then a pet dog, which is very cute. Like if that's your thing, cool. Personally, I wouldn't buy her just cause like I'm not a Paris Hilton fan, but if you like her, that's fine. If you like the doll, that's fine. But here's the thing is that if a regular Rainbow High doll retails at about $30, adding on the cost of those couple of extra accessories and then also the celebrity factor, I would have guessed that Paris would retail at like $50 to $60. If you're gonna go crazy, I would say maybe $75. But this doll retails at $100.
And like, I'm not here to judge you if you like the doll enough to spend that much on her. But for me personally, the math is just not mathing. So to circle back to my theory, when it comes to Rainbow High, it seems like the aspect that is out of balance depends on the particular doll that you're talking about. Sometimes the quality is terrible. Sometimes the retail cost is off. It all just depends. There's also a lot of divide on Rainbow High when it comes to visual appeal. I feel like people kind of either love it or hate it. So that's also a contentious factor. In all fairness, that's always going to be a thing. Like, again, not everyone is going to like everything. But when you add it to the other factors of quality and retail cost, having a doll that is not always the most visually appealing can be an issue. To say the brand is getting out of hand to me is a bit of an understatement. They started off as a brand that was celebrated for how much detail they put into their dolls for such a competitive price and have turned into a line that seems to be having fun kind of watching their customers dance, seeing just how much they can charge us while maintaining enough customer base to keep the line going. This one feels very personal to me because, I mean, I'm sure you can see behind me, I am an avid Rainbow High collector, so that one hurts on a personal level. But we're still not done, we still have to keep going, and now it's time to talk about one that's even more personal to me, which is Monster High. Monster High is, to this day, a wonderfully creative and unique brand. Dolls have long been seen as something that is made for young girls, so stereotype dictates that predominantly they involve pink and lace and sparkles in their design. And while Monster High definitely isn't the first brand to do something a little bit different, they took it further than anyone else did. Like, freaky fabulous. <laughs> creepy cute monsters as dolls? Who would want that? It's crazy. Uh, actually, it turns out it's not. Tons of people loved it, myself obviously included. I'm gonna try not to get emotional here, but the impact of Monster High on young kids genuinely cannot be overstated, if you ask me. Mass marketed with more detail than a lot of other brands, pretty much unmatched design creativity, and some of the highest level articulation available in dolls at the time, Monster High was really impressive from a technical standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint, they were even more impressive. The brand helped a lot of young people like myself feel like it was okay to be different and weird. It was okay if you didn't like things that were normal and that didn't make you a bad person. It taught people that even if a lot of others might view you as wrong, there's going to be someone out there who appreciates you and you can be yourself and still be worthy of love. It's a really powerful message and it meant a lot. I'm not joking when I say that some people have genuinely attributed their decision to keep fighting against mental illness to Monster High. I'm trying to say that in like the most roundabout way possible to <laughs> make sure that this video doesn't get like flagged for demonetization or anything like that, but like some people genuinely are alive because Monster High made them feel like it was okay for them to be them. Sorry, that's the emotion, like there's the emotional part, but like it meant so much to so many people. It was popular and it was important because it was so different. So of course Mattel decided to change it. <laughs> Mattel rebooted Monster High in 2016 and there were a lot of factors that came into that decision. Monster High had been around since 2010 and while it was still making a lot of money, kind of like Barbie now, it just wasn't making as much money as it had in the past when it first launched. 2016 was also the year that Mattel lost the license for Disney dolls, so that was a lot of their profit that was suddenly going to be gone. And Barbie was also still in the middle of her decline, so Barbie's sales weren't as high as they kind of wanted them to be. So with all of these things happening at once, Mattel definitely needed to make more money, and Monster High seemed to be a good brand to kind of use to make more money. Personally, I would think the brands love that it's weird, <laughs> like they like that it's different. You might think that the fan response and statistics show that the smart thing to do would be to corner in on that and keep doing what makes Monster High good, but just like level it up a little bit. Um, you might think that, but that is definitely not what Mattel thought. <laughs> Since the brand's launch, Monster High had faced commentary from parents and also just people sticking their noses into it for being against the norm. Mattel decided not to listen to their dedicated fan base, who was a little bit overwhelmed by the sheer amount of releases, but still who dearly loved the brand, and instead listened to kind of the naysayers and change Monster High drastically. Ironically, it's exactly the opposite of like the message that they were trying to preach, but. I guess they didn't get that. 
thus in an attempt to kind of capture the lost Disney audience, Mattel cutified their dolls. If you were around, I don't have to tell you how much turmoil rose up in the wake of this reboot. It was crazy. I think that most actual fans of the dolls could have predicted that this wasn't necessarily the right way to go or it wasn't going to be the most popular way to go, but apparently whoever made the decision of Mattel could not predict that. After the cutesy reboot, sales dropped even further, so Monster High's quality dropped, so then the sales kept dropping and eventually the line was discontinued for the time being. For those of you who are unfamiliar with this period of Monster High history or unfamiliar with just how bad it got, I do have a couple of examples here to show you. It's a really exemplify the drop off here. So this first one is a Gen 1 budget doll. She still has full articulation and some small accessories. So like she's cheaper so that it provides like a more affordable option, but like she's still cool, right? This one, however, is the worst of the reboot dolls. I am choosing the worst, not just to be mean, but actually for a reason. Some people really didn't mind Gen 2, the more cutesy Monster High dolls. Personally, they weren't all for me, but there were some that had a lot of redeeming factors and that I actually think are really, really pretty. The biggest issue is that they weren't just cute, they were also lower quality. I think that if Mattel had maintained Monster High's quality, even though they might have lost some of their original fan base, they could have gained new fans if the dolls had been well made still. But when you compound being super cute and alienating some of the original fan base with quality like this, of course your brand's not going to do well. Like, how could you expect that to sell well? <laughs> so yes, Mattel decided to reboot Monster High to try to boost brand sales, but instead the quality dropped, brand sales plummeted, and to no one's surprise but Mattel's, the brand got discontinued. Garrett Sander, who originally pitched and created the brand, has spoken out a lot about how he wasn't actually allowed to fully realize his designs and ideas for Monster High. For example, he wanted Frankie to have green skin, and originally the executives at Mattel were not going to allow that to happen until they did a focus group test with kids who were weirded out that Frankenstein didn't have green skin. Like, that's literally the only reason that Frankie got to have green skin in Gen 1. Famously, Garrett also intended to make some characters in the Monster High cast canonically queer, but was absolutely unallowed to do so by Mattel. He ended up leaving Mattel and the dolls that were his brainchild because of creative differences and having to change Monster High to be more towards the norm, which again is not what Monster High was supposed to be. It's very similar to me to what happened with Mermaid High where the designers had ideas but were not allowed to actualize them. And again, that's not the only reason that Monster High had a period of time where it went defunct, but I do think it was a factor. I do know I'm talking a lot about how the fear of being different and getting critique led executives to kind of ruin Monster High for a little bit. At first glance, that seems like a problem not necessarily suited to a video about capitalism, but at the end of the day, finances did still have a huge role to play in what happened with Monster High. If Mattel had retained their Disney licensing, they might not have felt the need to make their monster dolls cute to capture that lost audience. If Barbie had been doing well, it might not have mattered that Monster High sales were not at an all-time high. Or if they were willing to trust their designers instead of turning their backs on them the second profits weren't at a record high, Monster High could have bounced back from the slightly lowered sales. So in terms of the first two generations of Monster High, I think the biggest factors that ended up being out of balance were the quality and the visual appeal, particularly in Generation 2. Interestingly though, modern day Monster High, while it still has its problems, has very different problems. <laughs> Thankfully, I actually have pretty much nothing to say when it comes to the official Gen 3 of Monster High. The First launch was a little bit rocky, it was hard for a while to find the dolls in stores, but they are becoming more widely available. I will put a caveat on that, that that is within the United States. I know that outside of the US it's still pretty hard to find the dolls. Hopefully that's going to get resolved soon, but like, just to be fair, I do know that that's a thing. But yeah, I think Gen 3 is going pretty well. If you have seen any of my videos, you know that I'm a really, really big fan of Gen 3. And while I know that they aren't for everyone, I think the designs are well designed. And I also think that there is enough quality there to keep some old collectors like myself interested and also bring in a new generation of fans and collectors. So I think that Gen 3 is pretty good. No real complaints there when it comes to the content of this video. However, the Monster High collector dolls or alumni dolls using the Gen 1 sculpts are a completely different beast and are riddled with problems. So starting the timeline out with the first collector dolls, they came out in 2020 and they were Pennywise and the Grady Twins. Pennywise was retailing for $60 and the Grady Twins were $75 since as twins that set came with two dolls. This was exciting news for Monster High fans and even I was excited even though I'm not a horror fan, it was just really cool to see the dolls come back and the brand come back. 
And when you factored in the fact that these were technically collector dolls and there was licensing costs associated with them since they were from horror movies, the price really wasn't terrible. The dolls also had a couple of different buying options. So if you bought them on Mattel Creations website, you could get an exclusive art print with them, or you could buy them without the art print on other websites. So you had sort of multiple opportunities to try to get these dolls. Technically speaking, there was a third buying opportunity much later that came from Mattel directly. Mattel Creations had a pop-up shop in May of this year where you could buy both Pennywise and the Grady Twins, but honestly, it was kind of pointless because they were upcharging the dolls so much. Keep in mind, this is the manufacturer. They were hundreds of dollars each. And at that point, like, I would just buy it from a reseller on eBay. Not that I want to buy from resellers on eBay because I think resellers are a huge problem. Like, if you end up, that's fine. I don't judge people who do buy from resellers. But in general, I think people who buy dolls exclusively to resell them are a huge problem in this community. But I would rather spend hundreds of dollars to buy a doll from them than hundreds of dollars to buy the same doll from the manufacturer. They've already proven that they can make a profit on these dolls at $60 and $75 respectively. So for them to create a pop-up shop, show us that they're more than capable of manufacturing these dolls again, and then charge us reseller online eBay prices was beyond insulting. I was so mad when this happened. I think it's so dumb. So like... Technically, it was another buying option, but like, mostly it was just another mistake. <laughs> Moving on from the Pennywise and Grady Twin issues, though, since that release, there have been more collector dolls. Some have been from the Skelector lineup, and then they also introduced the Honkator line, which is like elevated versions of the original ghouls. I would say that the Honkator dolls are slightly above Gen 1 quality-wise, and they typically retail for about $75. I do want to point out that price because it's very interesting to me. Obviously, the Honkator dolls being Monster High brand, like, characters don't require licensing costs, but they cost more than Pennywise did, even though Pennywise requires licensing costs. Even if you take into account the fact that Pennywise came out in 2020 and there has been crazy inflation, if Pennywise were to be released this year, accounting for inflation, the retail cost would be $68.66, so like roughly $70. That means that the dolls that don't require licensing are still $5 more. It's not a big difference, but I do think it's very telling that they are now charging more for dolls that technically have a lower production cost. Even bigger an issue though than the price point is the process of buying the Honk Couture dolls. I've talked about my personal experience a lot in different videos, so I'm sorry if this is repetitive, but I do have to mention it just in case you haven't seen my other videos where I talked about this. So. I tried to buy Honkator Cleo because I was really excited about her design and I was prepared. I was off the day that she released, not intentionally, I just happened to be off, and I had all of my address information and card information saved on the Mattel Creations website, so I should have just been able to hit buy now and secure it all, except that didn't happen at all. I hit buy now, was told that there was an error, hit buy now several more times to get an error, finally made it into line, and then was promptly kicked out of line because the doll had already sold out within mere minutes. And this was not a unique experience. So, so many people have this exact same problem every single time a Skelector or Haunt Couture doll releases. And when it happened to me, I was so devastated, mostly because I didn't get the doll, but also because it didn't have to be that way. Cleo was the fourth Haunt Couture doll to come out, let alone the Skelector dolls. So by now, there's no reason Mattel wouldn't have known how popular she would be, or how many people would be interested in buying her, or how many resellers would be interested in buying her for a profit. In fact, I went on eBay and checked for Cleo about five minutes after she had sold out. And there were already over 150 listings for her from resellers trying to make money off of the purchase that they had just made, that I had just tried to make, but was completely unable to. Mattel is a big company, like a really big company. They could definitely choose to release the Honk Couture dolls on other websites like they did with the original Skelector releases. Like they could also put these dolls on Amazon. They just choose not to. Or if they want to have website exclusivity, they could work on their website stability or work on their website security so that hopefully fewer bots or fewer resellers are able to get these dolls. They could also just do a pre-order in the sense that they haven't created the dolls yet. They do a pre-order to see how many people want to buy them. Then they make them and a few months later ship them out. It would take longer for people to get the dolls, but that would mean that they have ample opportunity for everyone who actually wants to buy this doll and is able to buy this doll to do so. But they don't do any of that. 
because to them, the most profitable option is to make a set amount of dolls that they know with absolute 100% certainty is going to sell out very, very quickly also. Like that's a statistic that is good for them as a brand that a doll sells out in five minutes, even though it's bad for consumers. They don't care if it's scalpers or bots buying the doll because someone's paying them and as long as they get their money, they don't care who it is. It's more important to them that they get their money than that fans have a good experience. And these are problems just with the Mattel Creations website, just with trying to buy dolls directly from Mattel. But there's also a lot of trouble buying Monster High dolls from retailers. I do want to talk about the reproduction Wave 1 dolls really quick. Even though technically speaking those were Playline dolls, they were, like I said, reproductions of the original set of Monster High dolls and they retailed for $25 in store. I do feel okay including them in this section though because as far as I can tell they were aimed more at older Monster High fans who wanted to get the reproductions than they were at trying to rope new people into being fans of Monster High. They didn't serve exactly the same function as G3 does. Technically speaking, these dolls were available across the country. They were available on websites like Amazon and Walmart and Target and sometimes also in the brick and mortar versions of those retailers. However, there was so much demand for these dolls that I guess Mattel just couldn't keep up. To be honest, I'm not really sure what the problem here was. I feel like they should have known how high demand would be and how wanted these dolls would be so they could have prepared a little bit better, but I guess they just didn't. Regardless of why, the fact is that myself and many others never saw these dolls in person. Definitely there were some people who were lucky enough to find them in person and be able to buy them, but I never saw these dolls in an actual store. I was lucky enough to get some online. They were kind of popping in and out of stock online, but there was no organized release or set time and day for them to go up. So it was really, really hard to be able to get them even online. You kind of just had to be lucky enough to be online at the right time and place to be able to order through online retailers. So it was so hard to get these dolls, even though they were supposed to be very widely available like a Playline doll. And the same is true, but also still so much worse for the Holiday Dracula doll that recently came out. This was again a doll that was supposed to be widely available at retailers. This time Monster High did announce a time frame that they were supposed to launch online on Walmart and Target and maybe Amazon. And they had that all planned out, right? So there were people who were staying up till all odd hours of the morning, depending on their time zone, to try to get these dolls from online retailers. I don't know, because I wasn't a part of it, if they didn't come out on time or just only released a couple or didn't come out at all, depending on your area. Something was very, very wrong with this release, though, because most people who stayed up or even didn't stay up, most people who tried to get these dolls were completely unsuccessful. But there was a silver lining, right? Because they were going to be released at a later date on Mattel Creations, so you had a second chance to try to get these. Except it's Mattel Creations and we need to remember how buying dolls on that goes. So unsurprisingly, just like with the previous releases on Mattel Creations and just like with the online launch in regular retailers, that doll sold out within mere minutes. In my opinion, it's pretty much impossible to give Mattel and Monster High the benefit of the doubt in this situation. No matter what excuse you try to make for them for this launch being so terrible, it just doesn't quite line up. If it was an issue of not having enough dolls produced, that's on them because there's no real reason that by now, after two years of making collector dolls with kind of G1 sculpts, they wouldn't know how popular they are and wouldn't know how many people want these dolls. I mean, they also have a social media presence, so like, they can tell how many likes their posts get. They can tell how many people are interested in these dolls. There's no reason that they wouldn't be prepared for the demand. Especially given that she was supposed to retail at I believe $40, so a lower price point than some of their other collector dolls. To me, it's unbelievable that no one at Mattel could have predicted she would be extremely popular and think that they need to have a large supply ready for that popularity. And then also if you try to say that it was an issue of communication between Mattel and the retailers, that also doesn't make sense. Again, Mattel is a huge company. This is not their first rodeo. They also own Barbie. Like, they have been doing this for a long time and they know how to release dolls. This is not the first time that they've done it. They know how to do it successfully. They know how to talk to retailers. You also can't make the argument that it's the retailer's fault because it's not like the doll was only unavailable on Walmart. She was unavailable across the board. So it's clear that it wasn't like one retailer messed up. This was an issue on Mattel's end. And to just compound the trouble, pretty much during this like exact same time frame, fans are also struggling to get the real drama dolls. So these dolls, if you haven't seen, are pretty much the same as the Wave 1 reproductions, except they're mostly black and white and they have a little bit of a longer hairstyle. 
They also were meant to be play line and price, so again, this is meant to be more of a accessible sort of collector doll. And the real drama release seems really similar to the reproduction release in the sense that it seems like haphazardly stores have stocked them, and also very, very randomly they have been popping up for stock online. But there is, again, so much demand that Mattel seems completely incapable of meeting that they sell out pretty much instantly. There's no coordinated release, so you can't be somewhere at a certain time. You just have to get lucky. And with these, I said before with the reproductions that it was hard to find them in store. Real drama seems to be even harder to find in store, even though, again, they are supposed to be in store. It's also interesting to note that for some reason, I've seen more people who get real drama dolls damaged than any other doll. I don't know if this is just because people are posting more, but I have seen so many people who order these from different retailers and the box is smashed. Kind of a tangent to go off of, but I just wanted to include that because I think it's really weird. I've never seen so many dolls from the same line being posted online that they came in damaged boxes. So like, that also might be a factor at play here. Getting back on track though, all of the Monster High releases aimed specifically at adult collectors have been so bad. Some have been worse than others, but none of them have been good, which I think is just baffling for a company of Mattel's size that you can say that none of their releases for this brand when it comes to the adult-aimed dolls have been good. Like, that's a terrible track record. <laughs> and that in and of itself is so, so awful. But then you also have to add social media into the melting pot. I want to be so clear when I say this. I don't begrudge anyone who gets dolls for free as PR. I know that in the day and age that we live in, PR is normal. It happens in a lot of different kinds of products like makeup and clothing and obviously dolls. So like, I'm not mad at anyone who gets dolls for free. It's not their fault that they are able to get the dolls and no one else is. That's on Mattel. But because that's a thing, it adds an extra layer of awfulness to this. A lot of people have been talking about the fact that Mattel has no problem sending out Monster High dolls for free to influencers, but then they can't get their releases to work. So it's a really weird situation because it doesn't even seem to be working in Mattel's benefit. Like, an influencer can't influence you to buy a doll if no one can buy the doll. It just seems like a very bizarre priority to have where Monster High will make sure that influencers have the dolls in their hands, but they absolutely, under no circumstances, will make sure the average consumer who is actually going to pay for these dolls will be able to give them their money. In my opinion, with Monster High, Mattel isn't even trying to hide their greed. They know how beloved these dolls are, and so they know that no matter the circumstances, the collector dolls are going to be good money makers and are going to sell out. Nothing else matters to them. Much like I said regarding the reboot, that doesn't line up with the intended message of Monster High very well, but I guess Mattel either can't see the hypocrisy right under their nose or they just don't care. Putting it into the terms of the four factors that I talked about at the beginning of this video, I think that Monster High interestingly manages to add and fail out another factor. I do think that the consumer cost is potentially an issue because some of these dolls just have weird pricing. Not all of them, but some of them. Especially when you add in the quality that you get. That's not to say the quality is bad, but the quality for the price point I don't think is always perfect. But the biggest problem that Monster High has is just distribution. Whether it's because they can't manage to get their dolls onto shelves for people to buy or because they continue to allow scalpers to buy from their website and just let them get the dolls instead of actual fans, they're having a really, really bafflingly difficult time getting their product into the hands of actual consumers. And like, that's the whole job description as a company who's selling something is that you want to get your product into people's hands. So I don't know why that's so hard for them but they've managed to fail at that when it comes to their collector dolls. On that lovely note, um, I finally finished talking about the individual brands that I wanted to discuss today. So we're done with that segment. We are kind of getting towards the wrap up here. Bear with me for just a little bit longer <laughs> because we've talked about all these brands, but I do want to talk about where that leaves us as a whole. Barbie feels like a brand that kind of stopped caring because it no longer had to in order to make money. Mermaid High seems to have almost been sabotaged from the inside out and never really got a chance to start. And Monster High and Rainbow High feel like brands that both used to care very deeply but are now actively laughing at the consumers for how much money they can suck out of us for so 
little in return. It literally all comes down to money and it makes me really sad. I do understand that these are businesses and by definition that means that they need to make money, like they need to make a living. This is how they do that. They're companies where people work and they have to make a living somehow. There's absolutely no shame in producing something to try to make a living, but I think with Mattel and MGA and other doll brands that are currently mass marketing dolls, it kind of comes down to greed versus making a living. If sales aren't at record highs, companies tend to panic. And again, I do understand they have to make a profit, so having slightly lowered sales is not a great sign, but just because your profits aren't astronomical doesn't mean that you are failing. They are still profits. But big companies like Mattel and MGA see this as a problem, and at the first sign of slightly lowered sales, they make changes. And weirdly enough, they tend to be changes that I would argue are not for the best overall. Quality will get cut, designs will simplify, and the price will definitely go up, but it seems like the cost of production will never go up. Companies won't be willing to make a little bit more of a sacrifice or make a little bit smaller of a profit, even if that would allow them to have a product that has a stronger design that makes consumers happier. And to me, I think retaining customer trust and satisfaction is even more important than having record high profits. To me, if you have a consumer base that knows that they can trust you and is a longtime fan of yours, like if they know your designs are good and they know that you are a company that can be trusted, even if your profits aren't always at record highs, they will be stable because you have a whole community around you that is involved in this. But that kind of goes away when the trust goes away. I think that trust is really, really important in a company consumer relationship, but I don't think that these companies necessarily realize that. To me, as long as you aren't losing money, Maintaining that trust is like the number one goal, but that doesn't seem to be the case for these brands. That's not to say, again, that they shouldn't make a profit. I understand it's a business and it does take money to make dolls. I said this at the beginning of the video, dolls don't just grow on trees, they do have to put in money in order to create these dolls that are then going to make them more money. So like, you can't do it on empty pockets. I know you have to have a profit somewhere. But I think it would be nice if just once a company were willing to make $1.2 million in profit instead of $1.3 million in profit, for example. I think it would be really cool if they would make a product that resonates with people instead of sacrificing what makes their dolls special to keep the money coming in. I think it would be nice if instead of seeing a slightly lower profit margin and immediately lowering the quality, <laughs> lowering their production costs, and kind of ignoring their designers, CEOs would just take a little bit of a hit for once. There's just so much heart within the doll community. Obviously there's adult collectors like myself who have a lot of enthusiasm for these creations. The kids that ultimately are the target audience for most doll brands are also a huge part of this. And like, I still remember the Barbies that I played with as a kid. So kids nowadays are going to have these brands that they play with and they're going to remember those dolls as adults. And the people who design these dolls and come up with these concepts are just so creative and they're doing it because it means something to them. You know, like a painter paints because that's how they can express what they need to express as an artist. Maybe paint doesn't do that for someone and they create sculptures. To me, doll making is the same way where these designers do it because they genuinely love it. I think if people who genuinely felt connected to dolls and the art of making them were the ones who were making the end decisions, the community would be vastly different. I think about the countless people who do create from scratch their own dolls online and then sell them online and the amount of effort and love that they put into their small businesses. And I think that if those same people were able to have the opportunity to mass market their dolls, they would still have that love and they would still want to put in all of that effort. I don't see why their feelings would change just because suddenly they can reach more people with their creations. To me, the problem is very clearly that those people aren't in charge. The people in charge are more concerned with how much money they can make and what their bottom line is than what they're doing and whose lives they're touching with what they do. They make dolls and other toys by chance because that's how they make their money and not because it's something that they're truly passionate about. And when the people in charge continue to care more about money than what they make, money is going to continue to come first and it's going to show. Or, to reword it kind of using my theory, when the people in charge care more about the money than the creation, part of the balance of doll making is going to be off balance. And instead of fixing that, they simply exploit that imbalance to continue making profits instead of producing really amazing dolls. That's kind of a bad note to end on, and I am sorry. I wish this was a topic that to me had a happier ending, but 
In my opinion, it just doesn't. I think a lot of things that are happening in the doll world right now are really disappointing. Like, it makes me really sad that Rainbow High, a brand that got me back into doll collecting after not collecting for years, no longer really seems to care about their consumers. It makes me sad that Monster High, who is a brand that is supposed to, like, put people first and being kind first and being accepting first, can turn around and be so openly ignoring their customers' best interests. I think at the end of the day, there just is, again, a loss of trust with these brands. Even if people were to stop buying a brand, say Rainbow High, for example, I don't think that would really change anything. I think that if people protested Rainbow High and didn't buy it because of that, they would either hike the prices up of the dolls that they produce so that anyone who does buy is kind of making up for that, or they would pull a Monster High and just decrease the quality so that it didn't matter that fewer people were buying it. I don't trust Mattel or MGA or really any other big doll company to see people being dissatisfied with their practices and their products and make the right decision, which is sad to have to say, but that's where I'm at. I do want to say, because I'm sure that someone is going to be in the comments being like, if you are so unhappy with what the doll brands are doing, just stop buying them. That doesn't make sense to me. In my opinion, doll brands are way more likely to see people boycotting their products and just lower the quality and eventually fizzle out than they are to actually do anything to change the problem. Like, if I genuinely believed that me not buying Rainbow High dolls would make them do something different and change for the better, I would stop buying Rainbow High dolls. But I simply don't believe that's what they would do. I have been complaining about the price of Rainbow High dolls, which we're using as the example here, for a really long time, and I'm not the only one. Their costs have been rising for a while, and there are a lot of people who are not happy with that. Like, I'm not alone. I'm not the only voice. But nothing is really changing because Rainbow High is no longer a brand that does change when their consumers are upset. So I can either not buy them, and from my point of view, still nothing will change, or when they make one that is worth it to me, whose design I do like, I can go ahead and buy that doll and at least get a little bit of happiness out of it. Frankly, that kind of brings up the broader and way, way more complicated issue of ethical consumption, but I'm not getting into that. I just wanted to kind of address that because I knew that at least one person is going to comment that and I just don't think it's a valid response to this, I guess. So I suppose the too long didn't watch for this video is that doll companies will always put money above their consumers and we can see the decline being caused by that across the board. I know this was a long one, but you guys did seem pretty enthusiastic about the idea. So I hope it was enjoyable despite it being so long. Please do let me know in the comments how you're feeling regarding this topic. Are you kind of on board and like, with me in terms of point of view? Do you have a little bit more hope than I do? Like, I would love to discuss it with you guys. In general, I will say like, as a high note, I do think that the situation could be changed. It's just a matter of the right people having to be able to make the decisions. And I don't think that that's where we're at right now. Uh, but um, on a lighter note, I did really enjoy making this video. I liked doing more long form content. I liked doing all of the research for it. So if you guys also enjoyed it and want to see more of this sort of video from me, let me know in the comments that A, you enjoyed it, but B, kind of what you'd like me to make videos on. I'm really open to suggestions and I'm happy to make more if you guys like watching this as much as I enjoyed making it. In any case though, I hope you guys enjoy the video. I hope you have a lovely rest of your day or your night or whatever it might be. And I will catch you in the next shorter one. <laughs> Bye guys.